OK, so as I hear we are live now. So. Thank you everybody for joining today. Uh, <clears throat> I am Stefania Paredes Fuentes. I am associate, associate professor in economics at the University of Warwick. Uh, so we're very happy to be here, to be able to be back as uh, many of you might have attended the initial event that have to be cancelled due to technical issues, which is like the typical uh, situation that we are living at the moment. But we are very glad to be back and to have today Grace Blackney. And Grace, let me tell you a little bit uh, about Grace. Uh, actually, before telling you about Grace, let me just tell you that you can post your questions for Grace into the questions and answers section. And then uh, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to try to keep myself very brief. So then Grace has the, the time to address as many questions from the audience as possible. So please post your answers. If there are questions that there are already there and you're particularly interested, I think you can like the question. So I can see that and I move those questions forward. So let me tell you a bit about Grace. First, Grace, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, I guess it's a very special day. We're all very busy, very anxious about the news and what's happening in, in, in the world. So really, really appreciate that you are here with us today. So Grace is an economist, is a commentator and a writer for Tribune magazine, when, where she now also runs a new podcast called A World to Win. Grace is also an economics advisor for the Labour Party. And very recently, she has published few books. Uh, the first one, perhaps the ones that uh, a lot of you have read, was Stolen, published in 2019. Uh, Stolen leads us through the development of capitalism as we know it now, especially in the US and in the UK. Uh, it explains how and why capitalism links to the process of financialization, described as the increasing role of finance in the operations of our economies. And we have observed financialization happen in the economy since the uh, 1980s. In the book, she explains how the, this finance, financialization process is at the basis of the 2008 financial crisis and collapse of the system and the economic scenario that characterized the Great Recession period. This is stagnant wages, falling investments, growth of international monopolies and increase in inequality. The book concludes that the solution for this democratic socialism, uh, sorry, the, the book conclu uh, concludes that the solution for this is democratic socialism. So moving away from a system of private ownership towards a system of socialized ownership. And in the book, Grace says that the government should take control of the banks the same way Thatcher took control of the unions. More recently, uh, I had uh, the opportunity to look at the book, and, uh, but I'm not sure whether everybody has. It's been very recently published in September. Corona crash, how the pandemics will change capitalism. So I'm going to just ask Grace so everybody gets to speed. What is Corona crash about? And tell us how the pandemics has changed capitalism. Thank you so much for that introduction, um, Stefania. Can everyone hear me? Yeah? Cool, great. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna be talking today a little bit about my book, The Corona Crash, which you can get um, from the Verso website or you know, from any kind of good bookshop. I would say Amazon, but there's a lot of criticism of Amazon in it. So uh, perhaps uh, that wouldn't be the best way of, of buying it. Um, and yeah, I, I guess I'll talk a little bit about um, what the book argues and then we can have a bit more of a discussion um, about all of the events of uh, the current moment. And there seem to be quite a lot. Um, so the book kind of starts by looking at where we were um, economically in terms of kind of the UK and the US and the global economy when the pandemic hit. So it had a, a decade of uh, wage stagnation, of productivity stagnation. Um, there was a kind of secular decline in investment in fixed capital, particularly in a lot of advanced economies. And there was this massive global debt problem. 
So uh, total global debt had reached three times the size of global GDP. And what we'd really seen was a kind of, you know, stagnant um, economy in a lot of parts of the world. Uh, very little in terms of economic growth and in terms of productivity growth in particular, but a recovery that had been sustained largely by very loose monetary policy. So by central banks all around the world, particularly the big four central banks, encouraging people very, very strongly to, to borrow money and doing that by making it very cheap to borrow money. Um, and of course, through quantitative easing, which had lowered the costs of, of market financing. So of, you know, firms issuing bonds on financial markets. Um, and what that had done, you know, the combination of stagnation in the real economy and this explosion of debt, the gap between those two, uh, between those two things had really started to become um, quite significant. Uh, and you had in, in both the US and the UK, quite significant corporate debt problems. So uh, lots of businesses really struggling to um, make, you know, just, you know, the payments on their debt, their interest payments, let alone actually pay back the principal because they'd been loaded up with all this cheap debt um, because of a, a very, very loose monetary policy and because they weren't often investing it in ways of kind of generating more profits over the long run. You know, especially after you saw, for example, the, the, uh, the Trump tax cuts in the U.S., Firms took a lot of that money and just dished it out to shareholders or, um, you know, used it for kind of M&A activity, things that kind of don't create anything new. They just basically increase returns to the already wealthy. So we had this really imbalanced economy. We had a kind of highly financialized um, and overdeveloped financial system that was encouraging a huge amount of, of borrowing amongst corporations, amongst individuals. Um, and we had a stagnant real economy. So that borrowing wasn't really going any, into anything productive. My last book, Stolen, looks into this a little bit more and it kind of shows up the reasons for the emergence of financialization and why we ended up with this kind of unstable regime of, uh, of finance led growth. And then it looks at how that um, that model kind of, you know, came unstuck during the financial crisis um, and why that is, is, you know, quite an unstable model. Um, and indeed, you know, the book talks about how um, the 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 bubble effect effectively that had emerged in financial markets and in the real estate sector in countries like the US and the UK concealed the emergence of a lot of underlying problems and fragilities in our economic model, particularly things like, you know, low levels of investment, um, declining kind of productivity in a lot of sectors other than finance and real estate, rising inequality, all of these kind of structural problems that eventually came home to roost in the wake of the financial crisis. So this was the kind of fragile economy that we had before the pandemic hit, um, you know, and already last year I was writing about the um, potential for the next financial crisis, the next economic crisis. Uh, Again, just based on the dynamics of the business cycle, we were likely to have some sort of recession um, in uh, 2021 or 2022. So the pandemic hit an already very fragile and unstable economy. And now we're facing this huge unemployment crisis. Again, you know, you saw uh, in the wake of the financial crisis, the precaritization of employment, which meant that it was quite easy to kind of either lay people off or because a lot of people now are self-employed, right? Um, it, you know, they don't even have to be laid off that then, you know, just creates uh, significant problems in, in the labour market when you get a crisis uh, like this one. So we've got this unemployment crisis, uh, wages, of course, which have already stagnated for 10 years. Um, a lot of people are being asked to take a wage cut. Many more are obviously going to find themselves on universal credit, which will reduce their incomes even more. And that's very problematic given the amount of household debt that we know that there is and particularly the number of families who are struggling with problem debt. Um, so you could start to see that becoming a bit of a problem. We also have, of course, as I was saying, a corporate debt problem. Um, so lots of particularly small and medium sized firms that have taken on lots and lots of debt um, have already kind of, uh, you know, either failed or will struggle to make it through this crisis, particularly when government support ends. And all, that's couched in the context of a global crisis. And this is something I talk about um, in the third chapter of the book. It's just the fact that um, the globe, countries in the global south have benefited from a lot of capital inflows over the last 10 years. Um, I say benefited, but, you know, it's actually a, a double edged sword because as soon as this crisis hit, all that money flowed straight back out, straight into the United States. And now we're seeing the global south facing a massive, massive debt crisis on the scale of the kind, even more, more significant than the, than the one we saw in the 1970s.
So the question that we're facing today is, is how governments are going to respond and indeed how have they already responded? Um, so we, we kind of, you know, think that under this regime of neoliberalism, so this uh, change in the nature of capitalism that we've seen since the 1980s, that states have become smaller. And that, um, you know, what we're seeing now with states intervening much more in the economy is a kind of inversion of neoliberalism. You know, some people are calling it the kind of end of neoliberalism. But actually what we've seen over the last 30 or 40 years has been a change in the nature of the state, not necessarily a shrinking of the state. So the state has um, kind of basically reoriented itself towards supporting the interests of capital. And you saw that, you know, in the 1980s with all the changes to regulation that took place that allowed participants in financial markets to benefit. So, you know, the way that the government regulates the economy has implications for private um, investors, financial markets, business people, etc. And often it can create opportunities for, for profit maximization. So, you know, for example, the big bang and, and all those changes to the financial sector that took place in the 1980s created really significant opportunities for profit. That wasn't the state shrinking. It wasn't the state stepping back. It was the state using its power to support the interests of, uh, of capital and of big business. And you can see this today, for example, with the way that, um, you know, uh, companies like Serco are being used uh, to provide services like test and trace. Um, that is just a mechanism for kind of, you know, siphoning money off into the private sector for a company that isn't particularly effective at doing what it's supposed to be doing. So the state hasn't necessarily shrunk under neoliberalism. It's reoriented itself towards supporting private capital accumulation, support profits amongst private enterprises. And the pandemic has kind of shown this up quite significantly because what we've seen is certainly an increase in state intervention, but it's been an increase in state intervention that's been oriented towards supporting the interests of big business. So we've had big bailouts for um, for the banking sector and for investors, big bailouts for big corporations, you know, uh, pause for mortgage holders on their payments, nothing for renters. You know, the eviction, the end of the evictions ban is going to be a really serious blow. Lots of people potentially could be evicted from their homes. Nothing for those struggling with problem debt. Um, you know, very little for, for kind of small businesses that are struggling. And, you know, the, the bounce back loan scheme, the banks administering that loan scheme say that between 40 and 50 percent of the banks in receipt of those loans could end up defaulting. Um, so the kind of hierarchy that's been used to provide support, first it was finance, then it was big business, then it was mortgage holders, then a little bit of support for small businesses, then a little bit of support for well, a significant amount of, of support for workers in full time employment, very little for those in the private rented sector, very little for those on universal credit, very little for those um, who are kind of self-employed. So you, you can kind of see the hierarchy that um, is being used to determine who gets what during this crisis. Um, at the same time, we're also going to start seeing uh, a rise in market concentration. So this crisis is uh, supporting the strength of a lot of the big monopolies, as we, we've already seen. You know, I spoke about Amazon at the beginning. Big tech companies like Amazon, like Netflix, like Google, but also, you know, big healthcare companies, um, renewable energy companies. Uh, they're all doing very, very well out of this crisis. And we're seeing um, monopoly power strengthen a huge, huge amount as a result of what's going on here. Um, and that's happening for two reasons. So firstly, obviously, big businesses are more likely to be immune from the actual nature of the crisis itself, those big businesses. So, you know, the models of the, the business models of the tech companies haven't been affected so much by what's going on in the rest of the economy. Um, but also they are they have kind of bigger margins, which may mean that it, it's easier often for larger companies to survive a crisis like this. And they also often have closer connections to the state. So you can look at, for example, the big airline companies. They're often a lot of those companies have been really reliant on the state for bailout funding. Uh, obviously, small businesses uh, can't can't get that same support. So as this crisis goes on, we'll see a lot of small businesses fail and potentially they're being bought up by big businesses. And indeed, it looks like we're going into an environment of kind of long term, very, very low interest rates, very, very cheap debt. Uh, which means that those big businesses will be able to borrow a lot in order to do things like mergers and acquisitions, right? Um, and what that means is that we'll start to see, you know, potentially more really big mega mergers because there's all this money at very, very low interest rates chasing out higher returns. 
um, and M&A activity is, is one of the things that often can, can provide that. Um, so, yeah, those um, uh, the, the final trend I, of course, look at. So an increasing role for the state in the economy, but oriented towards the interests of capital, uh, increase in monopoly power. And the final one is, as I was saying at the beginning, a kind of uh, deepening of the imbalances of power that exist at the level of the global economy. So lots of states in the global south, um, you know, really struggling to actually just repay their debts, um, struggling to basically, you know, afford the basic equipment that they need to fight the pandemic um, instead of, you know, basically repaying money to uh, to creditors. Um, at, whereas, you know, states in the global north finding it very, very easy to borrow money from creditors. States, you know, some states effectively facing negative interest rates. So investors paying to hold their government debt. Um, so again, those kind of imbalances of power are going to become much, much more significant. So those three trends are, I think, quite important in terms of uh, like explaining how the pandemic is going to change capitalism. An increasing role for the state, rising monopoly power and uh, a deepening of imbalances of power in the global economy. Now, left to their own devices, those things could create quite a lot of kind of political and economic problems over the long run. Um, obviously, monopoly power is associated with high levels of inequality, with political capture, with lower levels of innovation. Um, you know, the states actually stepping in to supporting big business and big finance rather than workers will again be associated with political upheaval because people will be saying, you know, we've suffered so much as a result of this pandemic. Why are we allowing, you know, the state to just kind of siphon off loads of money to big business? And again, it's also bad for the economy, right? Because what we're going to be suffering from when this actual pandemic comes to an end is just a kind of standard crisis of, of low demand. And if the government is siphoning off money to um, big businesses, to basically the wealthy, um, that is only going to exacerbate that problem because the wealthy are less likely to recycle that money back into the economy. And because many of the businesses that the, the government is is giving money to aren't going to reinvest that um, that cash into, you know, new employment. Um, and then, of course, you know, that that issue of uh, global inequality um, is really, really significant, um, both in terms of like the functioning of the global economy, but also just in terms of the lives of many, many people in the global south. So unless we're kind of able to shift what happens next, which I remain, you know, fairly optimistic that we can, um, this could be quite a, a turning point in a in a kind of negative way for for the world economy. Um, but I do believe that this is also a moment where people can kind of work together and organise in order to demand things like the Green New Deal. And I'll speak a bit more about that in the questions and stuff because I think I'll I'm coming to at the end of my of my allotted time. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, the the whole idea behind the Green New Deal being that we need to have some sort of stimulus program in order to absorb the shock of the pandemic, but that it makes sense for that, that program to be oriented towards decarbonisation as well, um, both because, you know, green stimulus programmes create three times as many jobs as brown ones, but also because um, we need to meet our decarbonisation targets or face kind of planetary extinction, basically. Um, so, you know, I do think that this is also a moment that could potentially shift and could change and is subject to um, the capacity of people to organise in order to demand a different kind of world. And I think the that, that those demands should centre around this idea of the Green New Deal and indeed making it a global Green New Deal. So ensuring that all countries are able to have stimulus and decarbonise um, rather than just those that have easy access to international financing. But it does require people to kind of step up and say no to the model that we have now, um, which is one, as I said, where basically, you know, our collective power, our collective funds are being used to support big businesses who, which often, you know, then go on to dish that money out to shareholders or to lay off workers. Um, and yeah, I mean, you know, if we're going to get through this pandemic, if we're going to um, have a recovery that doesn't lead to another lost decade, like the one after the financial crisis, then we're going to need to seriously, um, you know, rethink the way that we organise and structure our economy. And now I'm going to open it up to questions. So I think um, either, either Rosalind or Stefania might be able to instruct us as to how you can ask questions, maybe in the chat. I'm not 100% sure. I'll, I'll, I'll hand over to one of you guys. 
So yes, thank you very much. That was uh, it was very interesting. I think summarizes quite well the main points in the book. S students are asking questions, in fact, already. And I'm going to ask you something that is related to what you just said, and it's related to one of the questions that we have uh, from the students. And in particular, you know, you end all this with a very optimistic, I think, uh, view, or perhaps like even the day that is today, I'm, I'm not optimistic at all, and saying that, you know, this is a moment for change and we can mobilize people in order to ask for a new deal. However, we just saw what happened in, in the US and whether it is a, a Trump win or a, a Biden win at this stage and I have it. So no one tells me anything. I haven't watched the news for the last hour, so I don't know yet. But we know that it wasn't a clear win for Biden. So and Therefore, it means that the people in the US are very divided. I think that if we do something similar in the UK, we are going to find that people are going to be very divided too, and, uh, in, in, at least on the political spectrum. So yeah. now the question from the public is, do you think a new Green Deal could possibly be achieved if Trump is re-elected? If yes, how will the war need to go about to do that assuming a complete lack of support by the USA. Yeah, so I think <laughs> you're right. It would be easy to kind of fall into um, a, a, a deep pessimism given the events of the last several uh, months and years. But I think, you know, what this shows us and what many of the most recent elections have shown us is that we are at a moment where people actually are demanding very, um, they're demanding something different, right? Which, you know, sounds silly given the what's happened with Trump and that they've, you know, that Trump's obviously managed to secure a significant proportion of the vote. But I think a big problem was that going into this election, Biden's entire campaign focused on talking about how nasty Trump was and how he's a really, really bad guy, right? And that might have worked when politics seemed like, you know, the biggest thing that was riding on any one election was whether or not you were going to get a good guy as a president or a bad guy as a president, it wasn't necessarily going to have a dramatic effect on your living standards, which might have been the case in, you know, the 1990s and the early 2000s when the economy was working, was ticking over by itself just fine anyway. Today, we live in this moment where in the US, the average worker, their purchasing power is the same today as it was in 1970. They have suffered really, really significantly, um, particularly since the financial crisis in terms of wage growth, in terms of inequality. Obviously, you know, they still haven't got universal health care. So if you lose your job, that's it really for you in terms of health care provision. Um, and none, none of the candidates were speaking to those issues, right? Biden's campaign, as I said, centered on this, like, I'm not Trump. He wasn't talking about Medicare for all. He wasn't talking about... Um, fighting inequality in any real significant way. He wasn't talking about taking on corporate power. Um, and I think that's why he failed to inspire a lot of people to actually come out and, and, and vote for him. Because, you know, you can't win from the left with just negative messaging just by saying, I'm not that other guy. You have to actually be able to put forward a real coordinated and coherent message as to how you want to change the country and how you want to change the economy. Um, and, you know, in many ways, as long as we learn the right lessons from this and indeed the right lessons from all the votes that we've had recently, you know, Trump won for the first time on the back of a bunch of working class voters who'd had enough of been being told that, um, you know, the best they could hope for was an Obama administration that did very little for them. Um, it's the same thing with Brexit. You know, people that campaign won on the back of people saying we want to take back control. Why did people want to take back control? Well, because over the last 40 years, people have been steadily shut out of all the major decisions that affect their lives. The labor movement has been decimated, so people have no control over their workplace. Um, our democracy has been captured by big business and by political interests, so people feel like they have no voice in our democratic system. Our democracy has become more centralized, more focused on Westminster. Local government's been disempowered. You know, all of these things add up to people feeling rightly very very disenfranchised and often just wanting to say well you know screw the system screw everything i'm going to vote for someone or something that is disruptive and um the right has captured that energy uh with you know very destructive xenophobic nationalistic messaging that makes people think that 
if they vote for this extremist party, things might be different. The left has often just sat back and said, right, well, you know, like we're not that that bad thing over there. We're not the racists. We're not the kind of xenophobes, whatever. Um, and, you know, indeed, we saw that in the last election, which was just completely and utterly focused on Brexit. And the Labour Party decided to become the campaign of Remain, even though we'd already had this referendum. And in this most recent election, uh, the Democrats decided that they were going to be the party of anti-Trump. Um, and, you know, whilst Biden might still win, it, I think we've shown clearly that trying to pitch yourself as the candidate of the, the very, very centre with no radical ambitions for, um, you know, dramatic change that is going to affect the lives of people. And indeed, without the capacity to make that message felt by people and to show and prove that um, you're actually going to deliver on it, then, uh, then you know, you're not going to win, right? Um, but Whilst that is the case, I also don't think that we should be kind of living and dying based on um, what's going on in the realm of electoral politics, because when I talk about wanting to mobilise and people kind of pushing for this Green New Deal, Biden did have a climate plan. He didn't really talk about it because, you know, he didn't think it was a vote winner, but he did, as part of his election, have a climate plan, quite a big one. And the reason that he had that was because the Sunrise Movement, AOC, campaigners on the ground had said, you have to have a climate pledge and it's got to be big or we won't support you. That's the kind of power I'm talking about. And that is something that I think is only going to grow, especially because, you know, at the moment we can't really come together. We can't really mobilize. We can't get out in the streets. We can't, you know, um, do much political organizing. I think when this moment is over, all that pent up energy is going to emerge into something. I think if we're able to channel the power and the energy of particularly young people, right, who have more than anyone else been screwed over by what's gone on over the last 15 years, entered the labor market during the financial crisis, decade of wage stagnation, decade of precarious work, high levels of inequality, extremely high rents, can't afford to buy a house. And then we're hit by the coronavirus pandemic, which if previous recessions are anything to go by, will hit young people hardest and could potentially have a lifetime impact on the amount that young people who come into the labor market now are going to earn. So if those, um, you know, those genuine concerns can be mobilized into a real and powerful political movement, which I believe that they can because, you know, it's happened before, then we do have the capacity to to kind of change the way things work now. It just actually requires everyone. And that means everyone who, bene who will benefit from a change to the status quo to kind of get up and make their voices heard. Thank you very much. Uh, so I will have some follow up questions but I'm going to try to stick and uh, see what the students are, or sorry, the public, because I know just students asking. So one is, hi Grace, I am a sociology student looking into the tourist response to COVID-19 for my dissertation. My question to you is, what do you think about the notion that the tourist response has been socialist? Yeah, I mean, I've written quite a bit about this and I, I fundamentally disagree. I mean, I think, you know, it comes down to this idea because often the debate in the media between the right and the left is framed as like, do you want more state spending or do you want less state spending? Right. And that is not the divide between socialism and um, and, you know, uh, neoliberalism. Right. Um, the neoliberals have been very, very successful at framing what they want as, you know, we want individual freedom, we want less state intervention. But actually what you've seen over the last 40 years has been an increase in regulation of various different kinds over things like the finance sector. But it's been regulation that's oriented towards allowing businesses to make profits. And indeed, um, you know, uh, that David Graeber, for example, who's, a, who's an anthropologist that you might have heard of, wrote this book called Utopia of Rules, which looks at in the US, this massive proliferation of regulation in all sectors of the economy. Because if you want to do something like marketize the NHS, you have to create books and books and books and books and books of uh, of kind of regulation that are, that is based on the idea of kind of creating something that doesn't exist already, which is a market within the NHS, right? Um, and so what you end up is these very, very hi like highly bureaucratized public service organizations, which don't end up centering on the needs of, uh, of the people that they're supposed to serve, but are instead kind of, you know, taken over by these weird new public management bureaucratic goals. 
um, that, yeah, kind of, you know, compromise service provision and actually end up being more expensive than just providing things by the public sector um, itself. And indeed, you've seen it in the university sector as well. Um, and yeah, of course, you know, the other the other part of, of neoliberalism and the growth of financial markets has been that it's rested on the assumption that if a crisis ever happens, the state will step in and bail everyone out. I mean, that was the only thing that allowed financial markets to grow so substantially in the period before 2007. It was because there was this implicit assumption. There was basically a subsidy that was when things get bad, the government will step in and bail and, and bail them out. And, you know, things always get bad in financial markets. Whenever you have a boom, it's always followed by a crash. And everyone knew that. It was just a question of when. So again, you know, the fact that the state is always there to step in and bail out big businesses, bail out financial uh, institutions is the thing that underpins neoliberalism. Now, on the left, there is obviously this historical association with basically, you know, a, the increase in the size of the state that took place in the wake of the Second World War. So there was the creation of a kind of genuinely national NHS welfare system the you know the growth of the power of the unions and an increasing role for the unions in in national politics um, and that was associated in part with you know with a, with a larger state but then again you know the real reason that the state had grown to begin with was to fight the second world war and in fact a huge amount of state spending during that post second world war period was actually directed towards continuing to fund the military right I think what a lot of democratic socialists um, say today is, you know, we don't want just a return to the kind of Second World War period of basically top down nationalizations um, and like an economy that is very state focused, because actually we know today that the state is often oriented, as I said, towards actually, you know, supporting the interests of capital and when it's not supporting the interests of capital, fighting wars that most people don't actually want to happen. So how do we kind of, uh, what's the message that we need to be pushing that isn't just, you know, more state spending? And I think for me, that message is, is about democracy um, because I think it's quite clear from a lot of the electoral results and indeed a lot of what you, you know, the responses you get when you ask people, that people don't feel as though their voice matters in the economy, in politics, in society. Um, they feel as though, you know, what happens in Westminster, you know, the politicians don't listen to people like them, right? And I think that's a lot of, of the reason for the kind of anger in our society. I also think it's a big part of the reason for why our economy isn't effective. If you look at, um, you know, businesses that uh, center the voices of workers in decisions surrounding production, rather than just going off, you know, the opinions of like people in, in you know, shareholders or C-suite executives, they perform better, they're more innovative, they focus more on investment rather than just dishing, dishing out money to shareholders. So I think really centering that idea of, of democracy, both in politics, so, you know, having, uh, you know, actually decentralizing power in our economy, so making uh, power much more accessible to people by empowering local government, regional government, by democratizing many of our institutions, as well as democratizing the economy, which I think probably is the main thing, by empowering the labor movement, by, you know, reforming corporate governance, um, by having things like democratically owned and run national investment banks that allow the public to kind of fund, you know, green infrastructure or whatever, having, um, you know, service users' voices centered in the provision of public services. I think that's really the only counter that there is to the power that's currently centralized in the in the hands of the state and in the hands of big business and, and finance. Because, you know, if you think about this, um, and, you know, certainly me as a Marxist, what socialists have always thought historically was that the ruling classes, i.e., you know, politicians, financiers, chief executives, whoever, the only counter to the power of them is the power of the majority, is the power of, you know, the rest of society who they exploit and they oppress. So I think, you know, having a real commitment to deepening democracy and making sure that we're saying, you know, let's push back against the influence of these, the ruling classes over all aspects of our lives and give people power and, and a voice um, in these institutions is actually the message that we should be pushing rather than just give the state more power, which people find alienating. Uh, can't hear you, Savannah. 
Sorry, I mute okay. myself. Uh, so thank you very much. That was, uh, that was very good. And again, so actually, let me. I come back to a question that uh, there is in uh, from the public, but I still want you to, to. How we get there in a way, because I said you said we, we have to mobilize people, but I think the ones that have been very successful and mobilizing people at this point have been far right parties and more populist right parties. And I think that the left had really failed in, in, in doing this. And, mm. you know, all what you describe, it can be good, but if we don't get people buying into it, that's not going to happen. So if you can link that to one of the questions we have here from Eric is what does a socialist economy include in a post COVID war and how could one convince a Tory led government to implement it, which I think it appeals to both of these things because I don't think we are not going to have a Tory led government for mm. a few years, right? How do we move from here? How do we yeah. respond to COVID and how, what else will we do? Yeah, um, so the question about, OK, I'll, I'll start by answering the first question. So what does a socialist economy look like? And then say, uh, how do we get there? Um, so the two things that I think we need to focus on are, as I said, firstly, democratization, but also the socialization of a lot of our resources. So I think, you know, um, not a fully socialist, but something approaching a democratic socialist economy looks like an economy where many, many more resources are owned in common rather than being owned for by you know a small elite and those resources are used to support our collective well-being rather than profit maximization so for example you know you might think about um so you know there were obviously all these proposals in the labor manifesto to renationalize uh, public utilities transport etc that's the first step the second step would be to have those um nationalized but also run by service users the labor movement um, in, a, in a kind of democratic way. So not just nationalization, but actual socialization of ownership and the democratization of ownership. I think the way that that extends into the private sector is by um, really strengthening the labor movement. So removing all the restrictions that exist for on organizing um, and uh, allowing the voices of, of workers to influence the decision making process in corporations. So having a much more kind of um, uh, you know stakeholder led model of corporate governance rather than just one that's purely based on the interests of shareholders i think it means socializing um how capital is allocated and this is really important because this is what the finance sector does um it you know basically determines what innovations get funded what kind of infrastructure gets funded what businesses get funded it allocates capital um, and i think perhaps one of the most important ways of socializing and democratizing ownership today is to socialize the allocation of capital so to have things like a national investment bank which is democratically run and collectively owned saying you know green infrastructure gets some funding research and development gets some funding you know this business these small businesses these regions get some funding that will be a really important part of it i think it means constitutional reform as i've said so decentralization getting rid of the kind of some of the archaic um, illiberal elements of our, our system like the house of lords for example i think it means more kind of democratic control over things like the bank of england which is making huge huge decisions that affect um, the distribution of, of resources in our country with no democratic scrutiny whatsoever. Um, and I think it also means, you know, uh, basically a, a significant amount of our resources being directed towards decarbonisation. Um, yeah, basically because, you know, that's not necessarily a kind of inherently socialist goal, but I think it is something that the vast majority of people want to see. Um, and indeed, it's basically, you know, the thing that we need in order to survive on the planet for the, the years to come. Um, so, you know, how do we get there? Well, I mean, yes, obviously a conservative government is not going to deliver any of these things. There is the potential, I think, for pushing, well, actually for stopping um, conservative and right wing governments from doing bad things at the margins. Um, so I think really powerful movements um, around kind of protecting migrants in the US, protecting um, uh, black people from um, from violence for you know preventing like really regressive um 
uh, environmental legislation from being implemented, from preventing really regressive economic legislation from being implemented. Indeed, you know, we saw that this time around with the trade unions really, really pushing the government to introduce the furlough scheme. Um, without the, the union movement, we might not even have that. So there is the potential if we're very, very well organised to have an impact. But yes, I mean, ultimately, you know, to do any of this stuff, you would need to have um, a left wing government. And I think that uh, you know, the, getting there is why it's so important to mobilise in the coming years. And this is what, when I'll, while I'll answer um, <clears throat> Stefania's question, I think a big problem that the left has at the moment in terms of getting people out on the streets and in terms of getting people actually to vote for different policies is that people broadly want things to change, but we're often convinced by, you know, the media, by the way, we're educated by, you know, the powerful, that change can't happen. So the biggest challenge that we face is convincing people that change can happen. And how do you do that? Well, you can't just tell them that it's possible. That isn't how it works. The way that people really become encouraged and enthused about the possibility of a better world is when they are organising with other people to change small things in their lives right it's when you take part in a tenants movement and you resist the eviction of one of your neighbors that you suddenly think oh wow i do have power or it's when you are in the labor movement and you're bargaining with your employer to say oh you know i'm going to keep my pension or i'm going to you know increase my wages that's when you realize that you do actually have power so that's where i think the left needs to be focusing today is actually on the tenants movement resisting evictions it's on you know in communities um on like local campaigns of importance to people uh, it's in you know the environmental movement um and getting people involved in that and it's ov obviously in the labor movement as well uh, really encouraging people that now is the time to join and get involved in a union um yeah so you know that that's really where i think uh, the left should be focusing and also where i think change will come from and you know that's actually what we've seen especially among young people like a lot of them have become much much more involved in politics than the boomers and Gen Xers that, that came before them. And that is part of what has delivered the big shift that we've seen in politics in recent years. Thank you very much. Um, so we had, given that you mentioned the role of the central banks, I think we have mm -hmm. one question here by Ronan says, Hi, Grace. One thing that the great financial crisis and coronavirus have shown is that the state and particular central banks have unprecedented powers at their disposal to prevent financialized debt, financialized debt, too late, I'm hungry, driven capitalists from eating it itself. Do you think there are any prospects for progressive to mobilize the powers of central banks toward their policy goals, Green New Deal, a universal basic income, et cetera, in the near near future? Or do you think there will be too much political and institutional resistance, say, from central banks themselves to move like this? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we're entering a really, really interesting time for the future of central banking because the whole reason behind the independence of central banks was, I mean, you know, the, the political reason was to say politicians set interest rates according to their electoral goals. So we need to make this independent for the health of the economy. It was based on the assumption that monetary policy had, um, you know, had implications for uh, economic efficiency but little or few or no implications for the distribution of resources, right? And what we've seen over the last 10 years, that's completely and utterly false. It was always false. You know, even when you look at just interest rates, saying changing interest rates has distributive implications, particularly when you're thinking about the, the impact that has on different regions of the country. But also, um, you know, uh, um, in terms of like the fact that when you have lower interest rates, often those aren't passed on to less well off borrowers. And actually what they do is they support borrowing among people who already have significant amounts of assets. So like it becomes a lot easier with very, very low interest rates for wealthy people who already own a home to take out a loan in order to buy another home or for corporations that are already favoured by financial institutions and financial markets to gain the financing they need to do a big merger or to, you know, um, like distribute a load of money to shareholders basically or to buy back their own shares um so you know interest rate setting does have allocative uh, distributive implications 
And QE has had massive, massive distributive implications because basically ever since the Greenspan put in the 2000s, central banks have to a greater or lesser extent and without really admitting it been targeting asset prices. When there's a massive collapse in in financial markets, it you know, central banks take it upon themselves to intervene in order to get the parties going again. Um, and, you know, the same thing has happened when the tech bubble burst, when the financial crisis hit, and now today, when there's a crisis, central banks slash interest rates. And increasingly today, they also pump tons and tons of money into financial markets. Um, and they don't raise them back up again afterwards. So we get this kind of bubble driven economy where, you know, there's a, 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 um, a huge amount of speculative fervor that ends up in a crisis, which ends up with a, a massive cut in interest rates and with QE, which then gets the party going again. And then the next time around, you need an even bigger cut in interest rates and an even bigger amount of quantitative easing um, to get things back to where they were before. And it's obviously a completely unsustainable system, but it's also massively increased wealth inequality because, you know, in the wake of the financial crisis, you should have seen a much more significant fall in house prices than you did see. Instead, we had, you know, central banks actively targeting asset prices and house prices saying, you know, we want things to get back to higher asset prices because there will be a consumption effect, basically assuming that if they increased the wealth of the wealthy by boosting asset prices, the wealthy would go out and spend that money and then it would, you know, trickle down into the rest of the economy, which obviously, you know, doesn't happen in the same way, in the way that they want it to. Um, so uh, what it has done is increased wealth inequality. Uh, and the reason for that is, you know, quantitative easing involves the creation of new money to purchase government bonds, sometimes other financial assets. In doing so, you are trading an illiquid asset for a, li for a liquid asset cash and investors take that money um, and they invest it where they think they can get a return. And of course, when the state is taking lots and lots of bonds out of the market, that means that um, the return on, on bonds is going to go down because, you know, lots of people need them and there aren't that many around. So instead, they put their money in things that they think will generate higher returns. And that's been equities. It's been property. It's been things like high yield corporate debt, which is part of why we have this corporate debt problem. Um, and that has obviously pushed property prices up. It's given us the insanely high um, price earnings ratios that we're seeing in, in, in equity markets, particularly in the US. Um, and it's increased wealth inequality because it's meant that the people who hold those assets have, have benefited while the rest of the economy, while wages have stagnated for the last 10 years, basically. So you've got rising wealth inequality with stagnant wages. Um, and yeah, I mean, you know, as a result of all those trends, there is this realisation that the things that central banks do matter. They have distributive implications and those should be acknowledged and managed. And I think central banks are increasingly recognising this themselves. So the Bank of England, for example, has noted that the the assets that it purchases through quantitative easing, it shouldn't be purchasing assets that are going to exacerbate climate breakdown. It should be purchasing green assets if it's purchasing private sector assets at all. Right. So that is something. And, you know, central bankers around the world are increasingly recognizing this. But there needs to be much. I think actually a big part of why that happened was because of public campaigning. Um, and I think, you know, that that should definitely continue and we should continue to kind of um, to kind of talk about these things and bring them to people's attention. I don't think we'll be able to see any significant change without a left wing government that's able to say we need to actually basically stop the fiction of central bank independence because it's not independence. It's just like letting central banks be governed by the interests of financial markets rather than the democratic public and trying to democratize the decision making processes that govern them. Um, I, we're not going to get that until we get, you know, a change in, in government. But I think we can begin to draw people's attention to what's been going on in monetary policy over the last several decades to how unfair it is and actually start to build momentum for, for shifting towards a more sustainable model. Thank you very much. I hope my money and banking students are listening. They have to write an assignment on this very soon. <laughs> <laughs> so. A question, I think this is one of the points I have left it almost towards the end because I say we will disagree and Eric again asks, is Lexit, Lexit posed to further exacerbate the UK's problems and would it have been better to stay in the EU given the power of collective action in, com in fighting the aftermath of a big economic impact? So I guess that was kind of also one of my general questions. It's like, you know, it's November, 
in general, we're supposed to be living the, the European Union. We don't have a trade agreement, and I don't think the situation for the UK people is going to be any better after this. What, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, we don't have Lexit. <laughs> we have a, a, a Tory Brexit, which is going to make things a lot worse. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, this was actually always the argument of people like me was that if Labour backs a second referendum and the next election becomes... Brexit versus no Brexit or Brexit versus a second referendum. A lot of people who didn't want Brexit to happen actually just didn't want another referendum. Um, and so, you know, either just didn't turn out or, or were kind of put off by the by the whole thing. Our argument was that if that happens, people will endorse Brexit and we will end up with a harder Brexit than one that we could have had if we'd been in the position to be able to negotiate based on an assumption that we would accept what happened in the referendum. So I basically think that, you know, if we'd gone about this differently, we could have ended up with a kind of, you know, Norway style or, you know, like um, EFTA style um, deal by now. Uh, because, you know, we might have been able to secure a Labour government or at least would have been able to prevent the Tories from gaining a majority on a very, very hard Brexit no deal position. That was always the, the worry and the concern. And again, you know, the issue came down to not simply the kind of, you know, the popularity of Brexit amongst the population, which was always kind of so-so. It was firstly the fact that people felt very, very strongly about the fact that there had been a referendum and that politicians always ignore voters when they don't like the result that they deliver so that they, you know, they were very, very, uh, you know, intent that this one wouldn't be ignored. But also the distribution of support for Brexit. Obviously, and, you know, we've been saying this, uh, people like me had been saying this for a very, very long time. The seats that Labour needed to hold on to and needed to win in order to continue to, um, you know, retain its number of seats or increase its number of seats are those with a significant amount of support for Brexit. Um, and, you know, the the issue there was the going coming out for a second referendum, which was much, much more toxic than saying we respect the result, but we want we don't want no deal. We want, you know, some sort of uh, of negotiated deal that allows us to stay in the single market or something approaching the single market um, was going to be toxic in those seats. And obviously, you know, that proved to be the case. It wasn't the only issue. Um, obviously, there was, you know, Jeremy Corbyn had uh, had lost, had hemorrhaged a lot of support. And I think partly that was actually to do with his position on Brexit. Um, and, you know, there wasn't the same level of discussion about the economic policies that there was in 2017, when obviously those policies were proved fairly popular. But I mean, you know, that was always the problem. It wasn't really an abstract debate about whether or not we, you know, should or shouldn't stay in the EU because the EU does have a whole load of rules and uh, and systems that make it undemocratic and generally oriented towards the interests of, of capital. I think that is probably true, but that wasn't really ever, I think, the point. It was about what is the end point that we want to end up with. And I think the more extreme um, the kind of remain uh, focused people ended up becoming, the more we ended up going down this path towards extreme no deal um, because, you know, that was that was going to be the way that the, um, that the debate ended up happening. So my, you know, to my, my view was always that we should, you know, Labour, the Labour Party should say we respect the result of the referendum. We will leave, but we will, you know, retain a close relationship, maybe stay in the single market, maybe have some sort of, uh, you know, alignment that allows us to trade very easily with these countries and stay in, you know, certain groups that we want to stay in um, and then say, right, well, that issues that this is what we're going to do on Brexit. Now, this is what we're going to do to change the economy as well. Um, and unfortunately, that isn't what happened. Um, so, yeah, I mean, and I think that's partly why we're, we're in the situation that we're in today. It's because the debate became so polarised and the middle ground on this issue got completely utterly lost. And now, obviously, we're heading into a kind of disastrous Tory no deal. Well, I mean, I don't know if we will get no deal, but it certainly looks like that is still on the table. Um, Brexit that is going to exacerbate all of the economic problems that we're facing in the middle of a pandemic. And it's not just economic problems either, the, the bureaucratic um, hurdles that we're going to have to overcome to get through this, even as the state is already completely unable to basically, you know, do all the things it's supposed to be doing to, to tackle the pandemic. So, you know, yeah, I mean, it is 
I'm not happy at all with where we've ended up. Um, I don't think, you know, many people are other than those who supported a no deal Brexit, which was not actually a majority of the population by any means. Thank you. We have, well, two questions are very popular, but they are very similar in a way. And is uh, how do you think financial markets and big finance can be tamed considering the amount of power they wield as lobbyists and the funders of politicians, especially in an age where through fake news and social media, so many people can be convinced that policies are helping them when actually they are just pandering to the elite. I think you have kind of mentioned this, but if you could kind of like make the point, you, you know, because it's true, these financial markets and big banks and big corporations and big investment have a huge power in the end. And they also have the power to mobilize people. So, you know, you say we are in, in you know, one hand, we have to kind of make people aware of these problems, but they have more power and resources than the left can have to do the same. And so kind of following up, I think there is a, what is your opinion about how this pandemic impacts the global market and investment banking sector, such as Goldman Sachs and uh, others. So hedge bank, hedge funds, etc., which I think there are two related, so you can address both of these ones. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to have to go after this one, unfortunately, as I've got an interview um, that I've got to do not long from now. Um, but yeah, so who has more power and how can we kind of mobilize to resist that power? I mean, part of the reason that financial institutions um, and the financial sector and as a whole has the most power is, as you said, it's down to lobbying, it's down to their influence over the, over the states. Um, and I think that is the, that is a big terrain of struggle, right? Because if you just set the power of the banks against the power of the vast majority of people, it looks like a much more even battle. And, you know, if people were able to come together and organize and mobilize, I think there would be the capacity to resist that. The issue is, of course, that those institutions have a significant amount of control over what is supposed to be a representation of our collective interests, which is the state. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, that's why it matters who wins elections. Obviously, there are a lot of reasons why it matters who wins elections, but I think that's one of the big ones, especially for people on the left who are kind of like, oh, you know, we won't bother with electoral politics. We'll just kind of try and, you know, transform capitalism through organizing. I kind of disagree with that because there is a lot of stuff the state can do um, in the interests of financial capital in order to kind of suppress our capacity to organize and to mobilize and to, and to fight back. Um, but you know that that power over the state is not set in stone um and indeed i think that is partly why those those interests and institutions fought so hard to prevent people like bernie sanders jeremy corbyn you know podemos Syriza, whatever from getting close to state power and being able to actually change things um so i think you know the fact that there was that really big battle shows that there is this countervailing power. If there was, you know, no battle whatsoever, then the big financial institutions and lobbyists and the media and, you know, uh, all the kind of the friends of the ruling classes wouldn't have fought so hard against Jeremy Corbyn. They would have just been like, oh, whatever, he's going to lose anyway, which is kind of what they did before 2017. Then they got a scare and they were like, oh, OK, right, we need to be much more serious about this. So I think that shows that there is this power. The question is, of course, you know, it, it takes a lot to it's easy to have class solidarity amongst the ruling class because, you know, they're like one percent of the population. It's very, very difficult to get the 99 percent who differ on a whole load of issues, except the fact that they have this interest in the transformation of the economic status quo to come together and work together to demand something different. Um, but I think, you know, unless we're able to do that, then we're screwed. And actually, the, the thing that gives me the most hope is the fact that, like, it's young people who end up leading this debate. And I think, you know, the moral power of young people who can stand up and say, if we don't come together to tackle climate breakdown, then it's my future at stake. If we don't come together to tackle inequality, I'm going to be worse off than my parents. That means something. So I think it's you know really really important for young people to kind of get involved in in these debates and stand up and make their voices um, heard. And then there was that question about how is this going to affect um, and banks and hedge funds and whatever. Uh, I think what we've been seeing over the the last ten years has been a shift in 
the nature of financial power away from banks and investment banks and towards kind of asset management um, organizations. So obviously in the lead up to the financial crisis, the investment banks became these huge sprawling organizations that were, you know, not just lending money and supporting IPOs, but had their own massive proprietary trading divisions, had loads of assets on their books, um, were just, you know, became these huge behemoths. Obviously, in the wake of the financial crisis, they were regulated more. And you started to see power and influence shift from those institutions towards asset management organizations, you know, like BlackRock, Blackstone, um, those big, uh, those big institutions that basically collect wealth and invest it in the economy, um, it, you know, and, and in doing so get a huge amount of control over over ownership. Um, and yeah, I think that is something that is uh, is going to continue. The banks are going to be really harmed by this crisis. They're going to have to set a lot of money aside um, against potential losses. Um, and, you know, we might end up seeing more regulation of them um, in the years to come. It's really going to be those firms that collect the assets of the wealthy so that they can invest them because there's going to be so much more wealth amongst the wealthy that are going to really need to be um, to be looked at and probably to be regulated more. Um, yeah, and I mean, you know, part of that comes down to pre-existing issues of inequality. So why is there all this wealth sloshing around the global economy that Blackstone can collect and then invest in, you know, buying up distressed real estate? Um, and also, you know, how those institutions work themselves. Uh, I think, you know, having something along the lines of, and indeed in, in Stolen, I argued for this idea of a people's asset manager. So rather than a kind of private organization that collects private resources and invests those strategically, that we could have a kind of collective pot of money that could be used to invest in strategic sectors on behalf of the general population. I think that would be something quite transformative. So, yeah, I think, you know, the big shift will be this ongoing shift away from um, from banking and towards kind of wealth and asset management. Um, and yeah, I mean, it will be interesting to see what happens to some of those uh, those big and very powerful corporations um, in the wake of this crisis. Thank you very much, Grace. Uh, I say, well, I will let you go to your interview now, but thank you very much. It's been very nice to have a chat with you about these topics. And I think all our attendees were very happy. Uh, thank you everybody else, uh, thank you for joining us today and good luck. Thank you so much guys, it was a pleasure to speak to you. Bye. Bye. Bye.